If you were paying attention to what Brad said on the announcement, you'll notice that my last name is Shank. Um, growing up, I don't know if it was destiny or if it was just a pure fluke that my life would be surrounded by knives. And that is what I do. It is knives everywhere. Growing up, my father's hobby was knives. And that knife hobby gradually led me into a family business of a knife company. And with that basis, I'd like you to keep that in mind as we move through and understand, like Brad said, what Damascus Steel is and why it's important to us. The core idea of this presentation, though, lies with this idea of the old new. There's a lot of products that exist today that are really just old products. So if you lived in 1968 when the Chevy Camaro came out, it was the new great car. Everybody loved it. It was the muscle car. Well, nowadays, we have the 2014 Chevy Camaro, which is not really a new product. It is more just an old product that's been reinvented, given a little bit of different paint, and all of a sudden, we have a new idea. Moving along with that same idea, if you were lucky or unlucky enough to remember pegged pants, I don't know which, which way it goes, that was the old idea. That was the original. Everyone was cool that was had pegged pants. Well, I believe that nowadays, the new pegged pants, which would unfortunately be the skinny jeans. <laughs> I'll leave that where it is because that's probably a whole nother presentation if we got too far into that. But with that, I want you to remember and to understand and to, to keep the core idea of the old new as we go through this to be able to understand the presentation. Let me start with this, the evolution of steel. Back in the Stone Age, we had men and women using flint and rock, and they would knock this flint off and create a, basically a cutting utensil, a knife. And as they started to use these utensils, they started to understand that, wow, these are really, really sharp. This is great. Well, they probably by fluke, they started to put these rocks or these flints into the, to the fire. After they did this, they found that when they broke that rock, all of a sudden it was a lot sharper. And they started to get this idea, of, wow, this is pretty cool. That things are starting to sharpen up. And as processes, as process went through, the bronze and the copper age started to come around. Well, with that, the bronze age and the copper age were, we were able to see that the smelting process started to, to appear with us. There we go. Now we're back. We don't want to see any more skinny jeans. <laughs> Sorry for the second attempt. But as we started to go through the Copper Age, we started to see that people started to create weapons. That was the basic, almost a basic instinct or feeling that we had. You had to have an, a way to take care of yourself and protect yourself. And through this Copper and Bronze Age, they started to create weapons. Well, these weapons, although they were great, you know, they were still relatively soft. They didn't know that. We know it a little bit better now. But during the Iron Age, they started to realize through these ages that as they started to pound the steel and to work it, all of a sudden, the steel got, or the, the elements started to get a lot harder. And they were able to control things and see things happening to their weapons that were far greater than they had before. Now, the iron ore that they started using started to throw all sorts of different characteristics into their weapons. Well, during the Iron Age, they, there was this thing called a Wootz ingot. Kind of a weird word, but if you can imagine a little tiny hockey puck that they were taking from basically areas of, of India and putting them in a crucible and creating this little chunk of uh, steel that they were now able to produce and to give to other people. So they were taking these Wootz ingots, sending them to, to Damascus, and that Damascus area was then a kind of a central trading route, and that, those ingots were being distributed all around the world to different areas. Well, these people were taking the Wootz ingots, and over different processes started to create something very magical with this, this core element. With that core element, <clears throat> which is basically the foundation of how we create steel nowadays, we got something very special, which is called Damascus steel. Damascus steel, in essence, is a wavy or water-like steel. It's got pattern to it. It's not just your basic steel. It was something very intriguing to them, and it also had a lot of aesthetic appeal to them. They said, wow, this is really cool. We're not dealing with these you know, bronze pieces of chunks, but we now have all these weird you know, kind of water-like appearances appearing in our steel. And they didn't completely understand what was going on. But with that, they started to forge or work harden these ingots. Well, over time, they started to realize that when we put this carbon or these contents into this ingot, all of a sudden our knives are way sharper than they used to be. 
there's theories and there's, there's stories of people laying their sword on the ground and throwing a silk handkerchief in the air and letting the handkerchief split over the sword. There are many situations where the Persians would come up to fight with the Crusaders, and as they went to swing their sword against the Crusaders, the Crusaders' swords were splitting in half. And they were saying, what is going on? We've got all these weapons that no longer work against these certain people. And it started to create this huge secret. These people that had these ingots and that were processing Damascus steel started to realize, wow, real big secret. If you can imagine, back then, it was like possessing the formula to the atomic bomb. They didn't want to share it. They wanted to keep it to themselves and allow their soldiers to have the upper advantage against the other people that they were dealing with, and with great reason. The beauty of the steel is always there, though. The kings loved it. They always liked this elegant look inside their steel. Not only was it sharp, it's extremely tough, and it looks awesome. I mean, it's basically a king's, you know, it's what they liked. Now, as we move through the swords and, and start to realize that they were using these swords in Japan to, as they were testing the swords, they would start to, you know, as the medieval times, so it was a little odd, but they would line up slaves and actually split slaves in half because they were so strong and so, so sharp. So they would line six slaves up, line them up on the pelvic bone, whoosh, six slaves are gone. They would take these swords and have, ironically, it says a red-headed child, and I, I've been told I have red hair, I like to pretend I don't, um, but they would take a red-headed child and while the sword was hot, run it through the child or a horse to quench that blade. And when they did that, they all of a sudden were saying, oh man, you know, when we do this, this, the pattern's even stronger. It's even more vibrant. And so you had all these barbaric things that were going on in the times, hence why it was probably called the medieval, you know, the dark ages. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's a little bit of reason behind that. But the problem that started to happen was these ingots that they were using to give them this great edge ability and this you know, upper advantage started to vanish. They were going to Damascus and there's no more ingots showing up. Or they might be getting one, and it's not holding the great edge that it was. And so this process started to fade away. Once something that once kind of controlled a lot of the world started to vanish, because the people that knew how to do it did not share it with anybody. It was a closely guarded secret to them and to their empire or to their village. And as this process and these materials kind of started to, to vanish, that process pretty much vanished from the earth. And it was pretty well lost. Something that was so revolutionary for their time was pretty well taken away from the earth. It wasn't until around 1970 that a knife maker named Bill Moran basically invented or rediscovered the process that they were using clear back in the Iron Age. And it's something that I have the ability and the opportunity to work with on a daily basis, where we get to manufacture this Damascus that gives you the wild appearance in the wild time or the wild uh, designs. So what I'm going to do is we're going to show you a video of how Damascus is made nowadays. It will, it will walk you through the layers or the processes of showing you the different layers of steel and walking you all the way through the forging process and then we'll come back and discuss it.
So that gives you a little idea of how we'd manufacture Damascus now. It's a little bit different. What you saw were multiple layers of steels. We alternate the different steels. You have a high carbon steel and a nickel silver. And those are stacked up into different forms, usually 25 layers deep. And then we weld that, put it onto a stick, and put it into a, gas, a propane forge. It heats up to welding temperature. Then we put borax on it to make sure that there's no impurities trapped inside these 25 layers. We then take it back in, raise it up to welding temperature, and weld all these 25 layers back together. You then saw that that process of those 25 layers that are six inches long is then drawn out by a hammer. Luckily, we have power hammers and not by hand nowadays. That's drawn out, cut, and restacked back on top of itself. So now we go from 25 layers to 100 layers to 200 layers, depending on what pattern we want to create. That's the basic idea of what Damascus is and how it is. There's 200 or plus layers sitting inside one of these type of blades or one of these pieces of steel. The samurais would go several thousand layers because they were working with very impure elements. They, had, they didn't have great steel to start with, so their process was folding and reforging to basically purify that steel and to create the sword or the knife that they desired. Now, Damascus is very much like a fingerprint. We can control or you can control the idea of what you want it to look like. If you want it to look like a tiger stripe, you can make it look like this, but this could be the exact same bar. Depending on how many layers are eliminated or depending on how many times the hammer hits that piece of steel, it will alter that piece. So once again, you can control the idea or the actual outcome, but everyone will be very individual. From out of the same bar, every knife is going to have a very distinct look from one to another. <coughs> now these are certain items that are manufactured using Damascus steel. Most of them do show in, in knife blades because that's what it's well known for. That's where the cutting edge comes from. That's what they were always known for throughout ages. And these are different looks that we are able to control in the steel. Each one requires a different process, but we can give it the same idea, whether we want it to look like a feather coming down or we want it to look like little boxes. Everyone is like a recipe. We can build it the same way, but it will always be very unique and very distinct. <clears throat> you can create tomahawks with spikes. You can create battle axes using the steel. Just like they did in their day, you were able to replicate using this incredible steel into straight razors and other items. Now there's other products or types of Damascus as well. Being San Mai, which is the samurai steel. That is what they created the samurai swords, where they would take Damascus, take another cutting steel, and take Damascus again and create a sandwich and forge those three pieces together giving you a very distinct cutting edge. So now you have the beauty of Damascus with the ability of a cutting edge from a different steel. Something that the samurais, if you look at any of the samurai swords, that's what they have on their, on their swords. You can see this very distinct line. Kind of another set of Damascus is called mosaic Damascus. You're able to create any pattern or look inside that steel that you desire. You can write your name. You can have ant eaters, ironically. You can have stars, you can have leaves, you can have whatever you want go all the way through the steel. It's not just a surface finish. You can even take it one step further and color it and have the color show up on those blades or those swords. <coughs> these, are more or these are more examples of mosaic Damascus with skeletons, with stars, with spider webs. And now you can imagine having these inside their your, your knife blade or your sword blade or whatever utensil it is and having the beautiful ability of the cutting edge. Mokumgane is a second or another type of Damascus using non-ferrous steels such as copper and nickel and brass and it gives you the same look but it starts to throw different colors in it with different chemicals that you're able to use. Now this was an interesting quote that I was able to find that I've always really liked. It basically describes that even from the very essence of who we are, from the very beginning, most people needed a knife or some type of basic utensil. They, didn't, they weren't just satisfied with having a basic knife. They always wanted to, to look nicer. They wanted to decorate it. They wanted to look really nice. It's the same as if you were to go out and buy a Volkswagen Bug. That may be your dream car, but most people would prefer to ride in a Bentley. We have this human nature that we want things to look nice. And that's where Damascus really comes in because we have the ability to make this unbelievable cutting edge with an awesome appearance on it. But also, then you have the ability to create these magical handles that go along with them. So in closing, 
on Damascus steel and why it's important to you. Damascus steel really was the basic of steel and what we use nowadays. It's where it all kind of started in the foundation of it. Every one is one of a kind. Never will it be replicated, and it's really turned into a fine art. And once again, the old idea of Damascus steel that goes clear back to 200 AD is now reinvented as of some 40 years ago. And we are, it is very popular nowadays. A very old idea is now all of a sudden a new idea. The, end, the possibilities are truly endless, endless with Damascus, and the ability to produce it in America is something that I believe our country has a lot to be proud of. There's very few people that are able to do it, and we are able to do it here in the USA. But that is my presentation and as to why Damascus is very important and, and has effect in our lives because it truly does affect every aspect of our life. Thank you.